this one. Um, yeah, so hello everyone. Um, I hope you're having a good EMF. Um, I know this talk is called The Future of Invention. It's largely a talk about um, artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, and generally, therefore, how we can apply that to invention. So invention is one of these um, uh, functions um, of, of human endeavor that is becoming, is becoming infiltrated with data. So everywhere where you have um, uh, an analog human uh, making, you know, making decisions and, um, uh, and analyzing information themselves, Increasingly, all of these are, are becoming data-driven. So, so this is something that, you know, this is something that's happening everywhere. Um, but invention seems to be one of those last bastions where people still have this vision of a, a genius in a shed um, who's kind of coming up with magical ideas and, and who knows where they came from. Um, but in fact, um, it's it's a deterministic process, um, and you can um, you you can use the tools that are emerging. Um, that are helping in creative endeavors, in art, writing, um, uh, music, uh, to also augment technical creativity, so inventive creativity. Um, and I think that this is going to have uh, a huge impact um, to, to a massive range of, of fields, um, in, I mean, all of them, really. Um, and so I think that the, 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 the implications of this change are really quite... Um, dramatic or could be quite dramatic and uh, it, it's sort of really great to think about them at this stage sort of when we're just at the cusp of, of these changes occurring. Um, so, so I'm going to start with a quote from uh, Mark Andreessen who, who coined this phrase um, around 10 years ago that uh, software is eating the world. Um, and what this means is that um, every, every area of human uh, endeavor is um, uh, is is uh, affected by software, um, and in fact, part of it is automatable by the software that we have at the moment. So the algorithms that we use, um, and 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 this is what he meant by software is eating the world. So every area of industry, of um, economics, etc., um, will have some some part of it automated by software. So it will subsume a lot of the um, uh, a, a lot of the activity that used to be done manually will become software driven. Um, but now we have this new phrase that, that AI is in fact eating software. Um, so this is really being driven by these three converging factors where we have um, increasing amounts of data being collected in every, uh, every corner of our lives, um, increasing availability of compute power so I think this image is from, uh, it's, a, it's a supercomputer. I think it's something that, uh, that, that Google uses. Um, and we, we also have uh, uh, the increasing availability and ad advancement of the algorithms that, that we're using to, to process this em enormous amount of data and, and use this enormous amount of computing power. So all of these three things are coming together to mean that this, this revolution is happening um, in many, many different fields. Um, so just to, just to bring you quickly through um, what, what a machine learning algorithm does, um, it, it's really summed up by this um, algorithm, sorry, this, this image here. That, so this is the classic example of image recognition, where you have this um, really variable presentation of a thing. So you have a dog, but pre, prior to machine learning, um, you would have to have very explicit rules about how to recognize what a dog is within an image. Whereas what we can do with machine learning is just give the machine an, a, a ton of data uh, with labels saying that in this image we have a dog and in this image we have a dog and repeat that millions of times across all of the different versions of images of dogs and the system will learn what a dog is um, and a cat and, and it will be able to, to differentiate between those things. Um, and we can teach it a lot more than dogs and cats and we can teach it to recognize all sorts of objects within images uh, and differentiate between those. Um, and so other than the applications that we all know about in, you know, uh, without these algorithms defining our lives in um, social media and uh, 
um, and, and, uh, and many other areas of life. We also see really big positive changes that are going to completely change the way that medicine is delivered with uh, automated cancer diagnosis, for example, but not just cancer. This, this, is applied to, uh, this is being applied already as we speak to many other fields of medical diagnosis. Um, also driverless cars, I mean, we're, we're sort of getting there, right? <laughs> it's, um, it, it's, it's always sort of uh, a couple of years away, uh, but the capability is certainly, um, certainly getting there. Um, and also sp spoken and conversational user interfaces. I mean, I think probably everyone in the room has spoken to an Alexa or a, or a Google Home by now. Um, and this is completely changing the way that we interface with devices. And this is all driven by this fundamental capability of being able to recognize uh, complex varying patterns that represent the same thing, so the same words or the same uh, objects that we recognize in images. Um, and yeah, this is an image just from the movie Her, which is the, uh, a, a great film about a very advanced spoken uh, user interface. So this, is, th this, this kind of um, recognition step is obviously no nothing to do with using the machine to create. This is a great tool to, um, for, for the machine to tell us uh, what, what we can already do, essentially, but, but automate that function. Um, but this model, uh, because you fed it, uh, it I'm, so I'm going to focus on images uh, as the demonstration example, but, but all of this can be applied to not just images, but also words um, and other sources of data. Um, this, this model has learned um, a huge amount of connections and relevancies between different types of objects um, within the images that you fed it in its database. So it, it, it's learned an, an enormous amount of information to be able to tell you that this is a dog and this is a cat and this is a light bulb and, and et cetera. Um, so so we, we, we can throw an enormous amount of compute at these models and create hugely complicated models, but to know what the model has learned and, and to benefit from that um, in a way that's uh, more useful than just telling us if this image is a dog or a cat um, is a really uh, recently advancing field uh, to, to try and figure out what the machine has learned and what it's thinking. So if we essentially turn these recognition algorithms on their head um, and we get it to, instead to generate uh, the doggiest image that you could possibly imagine, this is what it comes out with. You get, you get dogs made of dogs. Um, and it, 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 but, it, but it really shows that the algorithm deconstructs what a dog is. You, you've got fur texture all over this. You've got sort of ear structures and eyes and noses. Um, and, and, and they're kind of like uh, taken apart like a Picasso. And, and so, so, so this really gives us an insight into actually uh, what features the, the algorithm is looking for um, in order to recognize a dog. Um, and, and there's a, you, you know, you, you can get it to generate one image, but um, what, why not a slightly different image? You know, why did it turn out like this? Um, and, and that's, that's a really big question. Um, so, you know, what's the best way that we can communicate this hugely complicated model to a human in a way that a human will understand? So a slightly better way of doing it is to actually try and represent the entire um, model's relational space of many images. So what you're, what you're seeing here is that, that generated image, but uh, regenerated sort of tens of thousands of times for, um, for different things in the uh, algorithm's recognition database. So you can, you can get it to output um, everything that it can possibly recognize, and the most that of each category of thing. Um, so you get this kind of atlas, and this is, a, this is an activation atlas, as it's, uh, as it's known. Now. I've got the link in the bottom right there. I, I highly recommend this um, um, distill.pub. It's absolutely amazing for um, for understanding the inner workings of machine learning uh, systems. Uh, they've, it's open access papers, so I'd recommend reading through those. Um, so this gives us a two-dimensional representation of um, all of the things that this algorithm can recognize in image spaces. Um, and if you zoom in here, uh, this isn't dynamic, but if you zoom in here, um, you, can, you, you can see that each image is, is one of these, and it, um, it, it, it gives a representation of of the machine's 
uh, learnt space. Um, so there, might, there, there, there may be really interesting things here that the, that the algorithms learnt that a human would not have learnt, would not have known to look for. Um, so, so how do we get the algorithm to give us stuff that, um, that is going to be useful to us? Um, because we, we, we can, we, if we want the algorithm to be creative, to, um, to spark something, um, how, do you get, how do you get it to pick? Uh, you, you have to kind of constrain it um, in, in a way that uh, gives you something that you didn't know that you were looking for, um, which is a really difficult task. <laughs> Um, and so just to step away from um, art for a second, we also have um, uh, music uh, and writing where these uh, algorithms are also being used. And we can see another example of, um, uh, of where, in order to constrain the machine, um, for example, Botnik was trained on um, all, the, all the chapters, sorry, all the books of Harry Potter and asked to generate three additional chapters. Um, and mostly it doesn't really make sense, but uh, um, what it does learn is the style and the connections. Uh, and, and actually, um, it, it, it does quite well at, um, at kind of picking up the relations and the, and the kind of um, uh, the, the characters of the different, uh, the different characters in the story, if you know what I mean. Um, but of course, to a human, this, this, is, this is funny, right? This, this doesn't really make sense what it's, uh, what, what it's generated. Um, but th that, th that is also kind of creativity. I mean, th th this could be a new way of, of writing that a human wouldn't have considered, maybe for good reason. Um, ah, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, and so th just, just, to, just to show that there's a lot more going on than, than what I'm showing here, there was also a, 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 a musical that was um, written by an AI. Uh, it received two stars um, in reviews, <laughs> but, it, but it's happened. So there's a lot of people that are chasing headlines and trying to be the first to use AI to do X. Um, and there's a lot of, um, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of mechanical Turk um, humans doing a lot of work under the hood uh, with these things because they, they, they don't, um, they, they can create things that are interesting, um, but usually wouldn't be coherent in a kind of overall arc or anything like this. So you've got AIs are not composing um, whole, uh, whole sonatas and things like this yet. Um, so some more examples of some art, just because uh, th this was a recent development from DAL, DAL E2, um, uh, which is an algorithm by, uh, by I think by DeepMind. Um, where this, this is an example of how you can constrain the algorithm to, to take that representational space and get to output something that is not exactly what you asked for. It's kind of filling in some of the gaps. So if you constrain it and we say an astronaut riding a horse in a photorealistic style, this is what it outputs. So this is a completely automatically generated image. We've just given it these three input prompts into the trained model. Um, and we've got another example here. Um, so this is a bowl of soup that looks like a monster knitted of wool. <laughs> and you get these amazing outputs where y you, haven't, uh, you haven't explicitly said that the monster should have horns or that the bowl should be resting on wool. But it's kind of created these extra details. It's filled in the gaps where you haven't specified. Um, and that might actually spark some really interesting thoughts about um, how to compose your images or, or in, the, in the domain of um, AI-generated art, this, this kind of makes you think. Um, and it is a kind of creativity, although you're still giving it um, you know, top-down direction of, of, of what we would think would be funny or, or, or make a good image. Um, so images are a really good example um, implementation of AI because you have huge data sets um, and, and tons of labels because you know everyone comments on their photos, and this means that um, that, that, that we have in, enormous data sets for these systems to learn from. Um, but if we want it to generate art by itself, then we don't really have any constraints because what makes good art is a very difficult question to answer. Um, so so it's very difficult to get to, to to get this kind of image with you know to get a machine to give us something that's interesting 
Um, and we would say that's, that's really creative and that's, that's art without having input prompts. Um, so, so you're always really going to have human-derived um, input constraints so that there, there's kind of this collaboration space between artists and the AI tools that they're using. But it's certainly giving us a new way to, to, to create. So it's, it's a creativity tool. Um, and there's, there's a whole conversation going on um, right now at the moment, um, particularly in the AI art space, but also in everywhere with the AI where these tools are being applied. So, you know, is, is this really art? Um, is it really being creative? What, is, what does creativity mean to us? Um, is it going to take over the art industry? I mean, arguably, right now, there's a huge buzz around it, and there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of uh, money going into AI-generated art, and these kind of NFTs um, are, are, are part of that. Um, but I particularly like this title, that um, AI is blurring the definition of an artist. I think it's making us reconsider what an artist does um, and, um, and, and the ways that we can be creative um, to create art. But I think, for now at least, the artists are safe and this is just another tool that we can, uh, that we can use. Um, so to, to, to summarize that section, um, the, the prompt is always going to be human um, until, uh, it, it, unless you have some uh, constraints and some success criteria that are objective and that the machine can learn. Um, and tools that give us exactly what we ask for are never going to help us be truly creative in a new way because we, we're still using our human creativity to, to, to feed into the tool. Um, so can we imagine a system that will give us something actually unexpected with minimal or, or without human direction? And that brings us to games. Um, so games are a really good um, example of, of, of exactly this because we have clear, unambiguous rules um, that the machines can learn from um, and clear, unambiguous success criteria. You know when you've won the game. Um, the third thing that you have here that you don't have um, with art is that you can, you can create a database of uh, played games um, without humans being involved at all. Um, so the way that AlphaGo was trained is that you have two uh, players, two AI players that are basically playing off e against each other. And you can create this enormous solution space of, um, of all of the possible combinations of moves and uh, strategies that can be used against each other. Um, and this solution space can go way outside of um, what humans have even considered as, um, as, as plausible moves or actions. Um, and, and this works with games. So there are solutions, there are um, strategies that haven't been discovered in things like games because um, the amount of combinations of, uh, of moves that you have in a game like Go uh, is, is, is so large. I think, I think it's something like um, 3 times 10 to the 170 or something like that. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a very big number of possible combinations of, of legal moves um, within the game. So, so we can use the AI to, to much more efficiently search this, this kind of possible strategy space um, and then use that information to feedback into what it, what, what it shows to us. So in playing um, the, the lead, uh, the, the sort of most, uh, what, what do you call them, world champion in Go, um, there was a particular move, move 37, that really completely changed the game of Go, uh, where the human commentators saw this move and they were completely um, dumbfounded. They didn't know why it would have made this move. Um, and they said that no, no human would have, would have made this move. Uh, but nevertheless, that, looking back at the game, that's the, ones, that's the one move that the analysts say, this, this gave, them, gave the AI the victory, and this is what really shows the power of AI creativity. So coming on to invention, um, why, uh, why do we need this? Uh, the, why do we need new creativity tools? I mean, we, we, we've got ways to innovate um, by applying things we know to new, new, new areas and applying, you know, finding new technology to existing problems. So the, these are the kind of spaces that humans are quite good at, 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 at doing. Um, 
And in fact, you know, we've got more and more patents uh, being published every year. Um, so is there, is there really a problem? Um, and this graph uh, is, so I, I found this graph in researching this talk actually, and it's, it's, it's really quite stark. Um, so this is all of the patents published from uh, 1835 to 2015, um, analyzed by uh, the kind of categories or the, the, the domains of um, human knowledge that the uh, inventions are in. Um, so what, what you find, this black line that's going up at the end, um, these, are, these are refinements. So this is where you have um, an existing technology or an existing thing and you're sort of adding something to it or you're improving it a little bit, you're tweaking it. Um, and the red line that's sort of going up and then, uh, and then crashing towards 2015 is uh, uh, combinations. And this is where you're taking two separate domains uh, of knowledge or, or two separate things and you're kind of combining them in a creative way that, that, um, that, that, that creates something new. Um, the two other ones that you have here are, uh, that, that kind of stopped in 1880, these are originations and novel combinations. So obviously these are the, t the totally new things, um, but we're not getting any new, uh, we're not getting much new physics. So um, those, those are long gone. Um, but, but we can have new combinations, but, but at the moment they're nose diving. So why is this happening? Um, First of all, we have a growing burden of knowledge. I mean, there's there's 2.6 million scientific articles published a year, and this is growing approximately 4% annually. Um, so this, you know, this is way too much information for a human to to process. Um, secondly, humans are bad at thinking outside the box. I mean, we've had thousands of years of playing Go, and an algorithm is still able to show us a better move. Um, and finally. Um, humans uh, are really bad at thinking outside of their own field. You know, um, most engineers uh, have trouble keeping up with the stuff that's going on in their own field, let alone someone telling them that what's going on in someone else's field might actually be relevant to theirs because the amount of noise there is going to be much, much higher. So that kind of cross-domain curiosity is much more difficult to um, to, to have in a systematic way because you have to spend all of your time being an expert in your field. You don't have the time to be an expert in multiple fields. Um, so we, we do really need these uh, new tools to, to, to help solve this problem and to um, reignite um, our, our inventive creativity, our technical creativity. Um, so can, can, can AI actually be applied to uh, invention. So we have constraints. We have the constraints of the patent system that state that um, any invention has to be novel. Um, it has to have an inventive step or be non-obvious. Um, so this is a slightly difficult one to code, but it's not impossible. Um, and it has to solve a problem. So it has to have value and address the details of a problem. Um, we also have data. So we have um, te textual data about uh, the technology spaces that exist, um, where all of this, uh, so all of this research information, the 2.6 million documents that are being, being published, we can process that and categorize it, recognize the different fields, um, and we can also analyze the patent database. So we know which patents have been rejected and which have been accepted. Um, and so we can, um, we can use this to, 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 to train some models. Um, so how do we use it? So uh, uh, can an AI take what we want, uh, what, what we tell it vaguely to do, and fill in the gaps with something sensible? Um, can, it, can it take what we know and tell us what we should want? Um, so so the, the question of how to apply this is, um, uh, is, is not straightforward either. Um, and, and the, the trick is to get, to get it to give us something that we want that would also be useful and not just unexpected. Um, and I can also say that this is already happening. So we have um, uh, patents that have been published already that um, have been, uh, where an AI is claimed as one of the inventors. Um, so, so Dabas is a system 
that is, uh, I, I think, has two or three um, patent applications um, that are filed in, in many, many jurisdictions um, where, where we have an AI inventor um, in collaboration with human inventors. Um, and so the, the, the legal system is also, tr is, is also keeping up with this, um, and we're looking at new ways to, to define invention and how the patent system should change to cope with this once we start to augment or even automate um, invention. So you can imagine that once you have these kinds of tools, um, there, are, there are ways that you can approach it. You, you can say, I have a problem. Um, what might help me solve it? So as a, as a non-expert um, uh, in, in a particular field, you might know the problem, but you not, might not know all of the different things that could be applied to that problem. Um, so this can help you sort of explore that, that um, if we go back to that relational space that we saw with the image um, generation at the start of the talk, um, we can help, we, we can explore that space of connections um, by giving it prompts like giving it a problem or giving it a product that you might have um, or perhaps a technology that you've developed and um, maybe you're looking for new ways, new problems that that can solve. Um, or in the future, perhaps you just have, I have a business with many technologies, many products and many services. Can I have this tool that, that automatically keeps me up to date and tells me all of the relevant technology and all of the relevant things that are happening around the world uh, that link into uh, the, the work that, that I'm doing? Um, so this is the only branded uh, slide that I have uh, in the talk. So this is a, a slide from my company, um, iProva, and these, these Invention tools exist today, where we're um, using these uh, programs to, uh, to to sense um, the technologies that exist around the world, and make connections between those technologies, and suggest these um, sort of spark these new ideas uh, to to technical inventors, who can then take that um, and 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 make the next generation of inventions um, that 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 involve combinations and uh, that are more creative than, than what your typical um, engineer within a, uh, within a single domain would be able to make. Um, so th this is where we are. So at the moment, we're um, uh, giving humans information, and we're giving them ideas, kind of sparking um, insights uh, in the human mind. Um, what we're moving towards and what, 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 the, uh, what, what the domain and the area is moving towards is uh, helping to create the inventions um, and doing that in a collaborative way with the AI systems um, together with uh, humans. Uh, and will this move on to fully automated inventions or will there always be human, human uh, direction at the top? Uh, so this is still an open question, but this is, the, you know, this is definitely the direction of travel. Um, and this, this is fundamental, right? This is a tool for creating tools. Every invention that we create is something that has a function that changes people's lives, uh, improves people's lives, um, ideally, at least. <laughs> um, and so when anyone can bring all of humanity's technical expertise to bear on uns unsolved problems and perhaps 3D print any new idea, um, then you have, you, you, you know, you've completely democratized invention, which is a really, uh, exciting goal to be aiming towards. Um, but of course, it doesn't, you know, it's not necessarily going to happen exactly like this. Um, but this is why it's really important to have a look at this kind of direction of travel now um, and think about how we, how we want to implement these, uh, these tools. Um, and should patents protect these cre uh, creations? So I know that um, many law firms are creating a or they're calling for specific legal definitions for patents that have a, perhaps a shorter protection time frame. So if you start to generate patents and inventions much more easily, then of course uh, it, that, that makes them a kind of obvious, uh, at least obvious to a machine or easier to make by humans. So we should have lower protections. Uh, perhaps they should only be protected for a couple of years, five years or so, instead of 20 years, which is the current standard. Um, but what we do know is that um, AI will eat the analog inventor, and these tools are going to um, are get impact our lives in a lot of ways. Um, so that's it. Thank you. <laughs>